Hey folks, it's Ray at DCRayMaker.com, and today I've got a complete beginner's guide, user interface tour, tutorial, if you will, to the Garmin Instinct 2 series. Now I have the Instinct 2S, the Instinct 2, and the Instinct 2 Solar, though I'm mostly going to focus on the base features that are the same across all of them. I will eventually tap on the Solar features as well as the Garmin Pay features in the Solar editions, uh, but all this stuff is also applicable to all the other Instinct 2 variants. For example, the Surf variant, or the Camo Tactical variant, even the Truck variant, the diesel one. Uh, so it's all the same at that level, minus a handful of features that are unique in those special editions. And a quick note, this video is sponsored by SteadyRack, more about them later on. So I'm going to take away the 2S and the 2 Solar, though keep in mind if you want all my review information that's up there in the corner, this is more of a tutorial and beginner's guide. So starting off here, this is the watch face itself. Now everything on this watch face is fully customizable. Uh, I can just simply press this middle left hand button right there, hold it down for a split second, and you see the watch face. I can go down into this and I can choose different watch faces by pressing this lower left hand button. You can see right there some of the options I have. Uh, now keep in mind, these are just the stock options. You can also download tons of them, I mean thousands of them, from Garmin Connect IQ. That's their app platform, and that includes watch faces and data fields and full on apps. All that kind of stuff is there as well, uh, using your smartphone or the computer if you want to. But let's go ahead and get back to the top one there, the base one right there and I choose this upper right hand button, I'm going to choose customize. Uh, and this is where I can choose what data is shown on every given portion of this watch face. So the upper right hand button right now is showing my battery. I can change that to show me the day of the week, for example. I can choose this top left hand data field. Right now it's showing my heart rate. I can instead show me a different field like pressure or my steps uh, and so on. And just a couple in that particular case right there, leave heart rate. And then again, for each of the different components. Uh, so you can customize that as you see fit. I'm just going to back out of this though uh, and discard my changes and get back to the main watch face itself. So I'm just pressing this back button right there. There are five buttons on this, uh, the left hand three buttons right there. In general, this is going to be up, down, and uh, the light button up the top hand side there. And on the right hand side, you've got kind of your enter button and your back button. So now we're back on the watch face and I'm going to press down to go down here. And you can see these are called the widgets. Uh, these are technically the widget glances because they take only a third of the page information. So you can see there's kind of like basically three of them per page roughly, the top one, the middle one, and the bottom one. Uh, and I can open up any of these widgets. For example, the weather one there, if I press this upper right hand button, cracks it open. You can see the current weather. This is in Celsius where I am right now. Uh, the hourly weather over the next little while. Go down again, you can see the daily weather. Uh, and you can see the 12 hour trends, the air quality index. Uh, and then back to the main page. Uh, and this is true for most all the widgets, so I press back right there. So I go down to, for example, steps. You can see my steps throughout the day here, uh, my steps, my goal steps right there. You can see the steps over the last week, and then you can see the distance over the last week. Uh, and then again, all this information is synced to the Garmin Connect mobile app, uh, so you can synchronize that to the phone and then look at way more detail there than just what you see on the watch itself. And all these widgets are also customizable. Uh, so for example, there's my sleep widget. So if I crack this open, this is automatically tracked each night. So you can see my total sleep time right there, my sleep score. It tells me about the sleep, so you can see shorter than ideal, plenty of REM sleep. That's part of the sleep phases. I wouldn't necessarily trust that a ton. Uh, so just keep in mind, it's like maybe useful, but also maybe not accurate either. Keep on going down into this uh, sleep widget field. You can see the different sleep phases we just talked about. I went to sleep at 1.51 a.m. it says, and woke up at 8.55. That is actually pretty much correct. Uh, and then you can see my duration of each of those phases. And then again, I'm back to my main sleep score page here. Clicking back right here, uh, going down through more of the widgets, I've got my calendar, automatically synchronized, notifications. And then I have my VO2 Max uh, that shows right now. And this is based on, I believe, the running one, my most recent VO2 Max trigger there. Uh, it'll also show me cycling if I have a cycling power meter connected. Uh, and then below that, you can see the lactic threshold. It's a manual entry. And then this is the new prediction, uh, new at least to the Instinct series. It's been there for a while. Uh, but the graph is showing the changes in your predictive time. So you can see my 5K time. And if I go ahead and I can tap that, I can see the 10K time predicted. Uh, my half marathon, and my marathon time. Now keep in mind though, for all these times here, it's not just based on your VO2 max, but also based on your training load. So you saw that my 5K time, my 10K time, were comparatively faster in terms of pace than my marathon or my half marathon time. Because it's middle of the winter, I'm not really throwing down very many really long runs. So it looks at that and says, hey, doing a 20 or 26 mile uh, run at that particular intensity isn't viable for my current training load and what I've been actually doing. Thus, no matter what my VO2 max is, it's gonna kind of pull 
pull things in a little bit more. Oh, hey, actually, in a quick note, if you're finding this video useful, interesting, please just whack that like button at the bottom there or hit subscribe. It really does help out this video in the channel quite a bit. So going on back here, uh, down a little bit more, we see trending status. The last week's been a super low chill week for me, so it's gonna show recovery. Uh, and you can see that right there. It's actually quite accurate this time around. Uh, and you can see my, again, my VO2 max popping up there. And you can see my seven day trending loan, as I said, very chill week, only, uh, you know, right on Monday, this past Thursday, and it's a little bit today for some testing stuff. We've been like completely tearing apart the entire office. So but mostly focused on that. Uh, no current recovery time. If I'd done a hard workout today, it would show how much recovery time to my next hard workout. And that's important because a lot of people see the recovery time there and it's always showing something They're like, if I listen to this all the time, I'd never do anything at all. But the actual phrasing on Garmin's site is the next hard workout, not just your next workout. So do keep that in mind when you're planning things, uh, that it is between those more intense workouts. In general, you know, a lot of people kind of struggle with some of the trending status bits there, especially when you get unproductive uh, messages saying something's unproductive. The thing to keep in mind is that most of the time when it's saying that, it's because you're increasing your trending load way too fast or you're not in the right categories of stuff, meaning you're doing all just really hard workouts or doing all kind of too easy workouts. And the point, just like a real coach, is to distribute your workout load from being low intensity stuff as well as high intensity stuff. Uh, that is like a balanced diet of training. And the same is true for the watch itself. Not to say it's always perfect, but in general, when it's upset at you, it's probably upset for a reason. Now, as noted earlier on, this video is sponsored by Steady Rack. Given you're watching a video about sports watches and sports modes, it stands to reason you may actually have a bike or or a few bikes lying around your house, cluttering things up. The Steady Rack system allows you to store your bikes vertically against a wall, but also allows you to pivot them out of the way. Installation is quick and easy, taking only a few minutes. Once installed, there's no need to lift your bike off the ground. You simply roll it up on its back wheel and then put it right onto the rack. The rack will do the lifting for you and then cradles your bike by the front wheel, ensuring it's not being held by the rim, the frame, the spokes, so there's no damage concerns. They've got four different models from road bikes to mountain bikes to fat bikes, even a model for fenders, all holding up to 35 kilos or 77 pounds. About the only bike they can't handle is my cargo bike because it's like the length of a small car and would pretty much hit the ceiling up there. Well, I've got plenty of crazy tech gear here in the DCR cave. This has become one of my favorites. It just works every single time perfectly. If you want more information about Steady Rack, check out the description link below. With that, back to the watch. Uh, now, clicking on back here, we're going on down, Health Snapshot. This is a newish feature on the Garmin Venue series from last year. It's also now brought into the Phoenix 7, the Epics, and now the Instinct as well. Uh, now, the way this works is you crack this open, you put it on your wrist, so go ahead and do this right here, and then I press to measure. Now at this point, this is the next two minutes testing a bunch of things, including my stress level, my resting heart rate, my respiration rate, so breathing rate, as well as pulse ox and HRV. Now, of course, I'm in a pretty awkward position right now, both my arm and talking to you and everything like that. These values would be a bit high, but just to kind of show you how it works, at the end of the two minutes, it'll give you a completed score. The idea behind the health snapshot is to take all the metrics for the most part that it does behind the scenes anyways, 24 hour seven, but allow you to kind of control when those metrics occur. So a lot of people, for example, will take their HRV reading directly in the morning when they first wake up. Uh, but in a typical Garmin scenario, you can't actually do that yourself. It just, it's quietly using your HRV data for a variety of things uh, behind the scenes for recovery and stuff like that. But this allows you to kind of control when these things happen. So you can say, hey, I'm gonna do a health snapshot right now and then trend that. And at the end of this, you'll get not only the report, but the ability to go ahead and send that report off in a PDF format to a doctor or something like that to look at maybe for more detail. Now at the end, you can see all these summary here. Uh, in this particular case, I did not get myself a pulse ox reading. Uh, that's the blood oxygenation level. And that's because again, I've been moving around a lot and that particular reading requires really a lot of stillness to work. Uh, but you can see it on this other page right here from a previous attempt. And again, all that is in the Garmin Connect app. After the fact, you can look at all those, you know, historically if you want to. So going back to the widgets here, you can see there's my ABC, altimeter, barometer, and compass. Uh, so the compass itself, as I rotate, you see it's a proper amount magnetic compass uh, showing that rotation there. Uh, if I go down again, you can see my altimeter, uh, 10 meters. I'm in the Netherlands, that's real there. Uh, and then you can see the barometer as well. Uh, and you can of course calibrate these as well by pressing the upper right hand button right there. Uh, you can calibrate it as well as change the settings. So for example, I can change what the plot is from a six hour plot to 12 hour or 24 hour plot. Uh, so we'll do that. I can enable disable storm alert. I can change how the sensor works. 
altimeter only, barometer only, for example. Uh, I can also show or change uh, what type of pressure reading it's going to show there. So clicking on back, for example, we should now see uh, that longer range there of 24 hours for the barometer. Uh, and you can do this for each one individually. So for example, this one as well, I can go into settings and I go down. I can also change the elevation from being uh, meters to feet or vice versa. And we'll click on back here and get back to the main widget menu. And then continue on down here. This is where I can go ahead and edit any of the particular widgets I want to. You can see all the ones that I've got currently loaded. And if I go to the very bottom, I can add even more. Uh, so these are additional ones I can add there. Uh, there's also ones in the past that you saw there, like for example, uh, the music controls. There is no music storage on the Instinct itself, uh, so this is purely controlling what is on your phone. Now, let's go ahead and back out real quick, all the way back to the main watch face. I want to show you the controls menu. That's in the upper left-hand corner right there. You just simply hold this down for a second, and this gets to a bit of like a quick access menu. Uh, you can see I can turn off the watch if I wanted to. I can turn on battery saver to go ahead and dramatically uh, extend my battery out. And we're talking like weeks here as opposed to just days. Uh, I can go ahead and change the backlight brightness if I wanted to. I can go and turn on and off do not disturb. I can lock the keys. I can access the music controls. And I can find my phone in case I can't do that or can't find that. Uh, but if I click on back right here, we can also customize these through the settings menu. Hold this middle left hand button like that. And we go on down. Uh, so you can see activities and app. These are all sport modes that we'll get into in just a moment. Notifications and alerts appearance. This is where I can change what's in that controls menu. So you can see right there, I'm going to go down to the bottom again, uh, and I can add additional ones to this. Uh, so for example, I can set time with GPS if I wanted to, altimeter, timers, alert. Many of the same widget functions are accessible via the controls menu, including broadcasting heart rate is there as well as assistance. Uh, so we'll leave that alone for right now. Keep on going down in the settings menu. We've got things like sensors and accessories. This is primarily sports sensors, almost entirely actually sports sensors uh, in the case of Instinct. And I'm going to dive into that in the sports section in just a second. So going on down here, this is the map settings. Uh, so I can change the track orientation, user location, zoom. Uh, you can't access all your map stuff from here. And there is no real maps on here. It's more about like map ping and the, the concept of it than it is maps itself. Uh, and there's phone pairings there, user profiles for setting up your uh, age and height and weight so you get accurate calorie information. Uh, safety settings, that's where you can set up in here uh, what happens to instant detection. Instant detection is if you're cycling along or running and you fall, it'll detect those G-forces and it'll go ahead and notify your friends and family after a given alert time period. So you've got about 10 seconds to stop that from triggering if you have it enabled before it notifies your friends and family. That does require your phone to be with you. Given there is no cellular in any of the Instinct series at all, uh, it does leverage your phone's cellular connection for that. So as long as your phone is nearby, it'll go ahead and do that. You can see here you can turn those settings on or off on a per sport profile. So bike on, bike commute on, bike tour, gravel bike, hike, road bike, run, trail run, walk, e-bike, etc. Some people will turn this off for the mountain biking side of stuff because it may false positive trigger a fair bit. What Garmin's essentially looking for here is not just a big G-force event. So for example, going off a jump won't necessarily trigger it, but it's the speed going from something to zero combined with a G-force event. So the idea that you may be going along at 20 miles an hour and then boom, there's a huge G-force event and you instantly stop. That probably tells you that something went wrong there versus just simply having a big G-force event is just simply a jump at mountain biking. Anyways, clicking on back here, uh, assistance. The idea behind assistance is that you can go ahead and send a notification to a friend or family uh, if you're not feeling safe. So this allows you to hold down this button here for three seconds, and it basically sends out like a quiet live track link to your friend or family that you've kind of preset up behind the scenes. So at that point, they'll get notified of your location uh, and your continuous location from there on forward. So as long as you're wearing the watch, as long as your phone's with you, it's going to keep on giving them your location the entire time uh, so they can you know, kind of keep tabs on you. Uh, going on back here, you can set up what your emergency contacts are for both of those scenarios. Uh, and then going on back again, we have health and wellness. This is where you can go and change things like your heart rate, high and low alerts. Uh, there is no ECG capability on this, but you can go ahead and set abnormal heart rate alerts. So this is typically ones that are either too high or too low for normal circumstances, not for sport modes. This is basically just day-to-day -day wear where all of a sudden it spikes super, super high. It'll go ahead and alert you that maybe something to kind of look into. Uh, going on back here again, broadcast heart rate. This allows you to broadcast your heart rate from the instinct to another device. Uh, so for example, if you're on a Peloton bike or at a gym or something like that, as long as that gym piece of equipment supports either AMP Plus or Bluetooth Smart, then you're good to go. The Instinct does broadcast to both of those concurrently. So once you enable this, either here or through other menu options, uh, you can go ahead and you know see your heart rate on the devices. Uh, so in this case, you can see it connect to my iPhone automatically. Uh, it's going to broadcast to that. You can also turn this on on a per sport profile basis. Uh, so you may want to record on your watch, but also show it on a screen at a gym or a hotel or something like that. So going on back here, 
back down. Pulse ox. Uh, pulse ox is the red light on the back uh, that measures your blood oxygenation level. So this is the optical heart rate sensor. Uh, and if I put my finger over, it should go ahead and light up the green. You can see that right there. That's the green light for normal heart rate. Uh, but if I go ahead and do a pulse ox check, it'll go ahead and light up a red light, uh, which measures the blood oxygenation level. Now with the instinct, you have three kind of options here. If you open this up, uh, you have a manual check, which means you just check it on demand when you want to. You have during sleep, which means during sleep, it'll monitor that value. And then you have all day. Now this is the setting you want if you want your battery life to die like within just a couple of days. Uh, the pulse ox option here is the biggest battery burn aside from like GPS on the Garmin Instinct. And it's true on all Garmin watches, it's true on really any watch out there. It's just a huge battery blowtorch. So I would never recommend putting on all day or even during sleep unless you have a very specific reason to do that. Uh, in general, it's just better to do a manual check of pulse ox if you need to, uh, rather than having the watch try to figure it out. Just the battery hit simply isn't worth it in the vast majority of cases. There are really two scenarios that people like to use blood oxygenation level uh, from a tracking standpoint. The first is high altitude hiking. Uh, we're up you know, in the mountains at very, very high altitudes, and you want to use that as kind of a threshold or a way to monitor things. Uh, the second is in some cases for sleep tracking, for sleep apnea, uh, they'll use that. The challenge with both of those is that usually you control what you're doing in that case. Uh, and so this is definitely not a medical device and you would see that if you look at the accuracy um, of that. But it also, those sort of tests are meant to be like when you're perfectly still controlling the scenario uh, versus if you're just you know, tumbling around in the middle of the bed at night, uh, it'll take that reading, it may not be accurate. And the same is true if you're doing 24 by seven, it could be when it thinks you're still, but you aren't really still in the, the readings aren't that accurate. So I just do manual checks when you want that. Anyways, going on back here, uh, we got navigation, we'll talk about in just a second. Power manager, this is where you can configure different power modes. Uh, so battery saver will go and shut down everything, but watch out the battery. This would be up to 65 days if I were to enable this right now, uh, from the current 60 or 16 days. I believe I have roughly half battery right now on this unit. Uh, so that's a huge uh, increase of battery, but it comes with turning off a lot of features. So if I go down to edit, you can see what it'll do once I enable that. Uh, it'll go ahead and put the watch face into low power mode. It turns off the phone, it turns off my wrist heart rate, it turns off pulse locks, it turns off the backlight, uh, but you do get 65 days. So if those things don't matter to you, perhaps you're out in the wilderness or something like that, that's a massive savings. And this is 65 days with half the battery remaining. So basically double that with you know more battery. And one trick to extending the battery life out is to go ahead and enable this just for sleep. So if I do this right here, it'll automatically go into that low battery profile uh, at sleep. So if you don't care about your heart rate at night and all the downstream impacts of that, so for example, it's not gonna do a lot of different sleep tracking metrics and stuff like that, then this is an option there. Uh, but again, you're sacrificing some of the data from this watch to go ahead and extend out your battery life. Okay, backing out again here, down to the main watch face. And now we're gonna look at sport modes. So to access the sport modes, you're gonna press this upper right hand button right there. And now you have all the sport modes that I've configured already as my favorites. So in this case, I've got triathlon, hike, run, bike, treadmill, run, sorry, bike indoors, mountain bike, open run, open water. Golf isn't a favorite, but I had to demo it. So there we go. Uh, virtual run, yoga, strength, trail run, ski. These are all things that I've added in. Uh, but I can just go down here and you can see there's uh, non-favorites. So navigation, expedition, track me, project waypoint, area calculation, pulse ox, and then click add. And now I've got a boatload more. So I'm just gonna kind of scroll through these here so you can see all these. Uh, these are all the ones that are supported today. There's also track running coming, outdoor track running uh, coming to the Instinct 2 series. Uh, so I can choose any of these to add to my favorites list. So for example, I'm gonna add e-bike right there set as a favorite and you choose yes. Now as a general rule of thumb, these sport profiles kind of have two purposes to them. Uh, number one is to allow you to customize all the settings for that given profile. So things like data pages and whether or not it creates an auto lap and, and exact fields on those data pages. All that stuff is totally customizable here, but also customizes the calorie calculations for that particular sport profile. And then beyond that, it also has data metrics that are applicable to that particular sport profile. For example, in skiing there, you would get things like the number of runs that you have automatically calculated. It'll automatically track as you go up in chairlift and come back down again, your max speed per run, your total uh, descent for the day. Uh, and in the case of things like, let's see, yoga or strength training, it can count reps uh, for strength training. Uh, in the case of open water swimming, it'll count your strokes out in open water swimming. It has a special mode for open water swimming because of the fact that each time your wrist goes underwater, it loses a GPS signal, and then it gains again, it comes back above the water. So it's gotta, it's gotta do all the kind of special stuff. So every single mode here, by and large, has something special to it. Where you see them a little more close is something like walk versus run. 
at its core, those are more or less the same thing. Uh, but even those have slight differences in terms of things like VO2 max tracking, uh, as well as the run dynamics and stuff like that, that are different. So then choose one of them. We'll choose the run one right there. And we'll crack that open. Now you can see it's going to try to find GPS. That's on this outer right hand side right there. This little bubble will eventually fill up when it finds GPS. I'm underground a building. It's, it's not going to find GPS. Uh, you can see it's connected to my phone and it's trying to find my heart rate. If I flip it over here and put my finger back on it again, it'll give it a couple seconds and I'll go and turn green. There we go. And try to find that. Now keep in mind, there's a pretty big difference between the heart rate sensor operating in 24 by 7 mode and in workout mode. In workout mode, it goes and increases power to this to get more accurate results. So if you were to go ahead and do a workout without going into workout mode, you're not going to see likely accurate heart rate, especially at higher intensities. Uh, and you can see this change in power. In fact, when I take a finger off, watch it gets brighter there. That's an example of that kind of increase in power to get more accuracy out of it. Uh, so I can change my sport mode settings right here. I press this middle left hand button that gets into the run settings uh, and I can open that up. I can change my data screens. There we go. I can scroll on down through here. Lots of different data pages I can add and customize. Uh, so for example, I'm going to add a page right there. I'm going to choose custom data. I'm going to increase the data fields. You can change, choose how many fields you want there. So you can see right now four different fields, uh, now up to five different fields. There we go. I'll choose this, choose field one, and you'll just simply iterate through this. I'll choose timer, fields two, uh, timer fields. Let's just go with uh, lap time. Choose field three, distance field. We'll just go to distance. Field four, uh, we'll go pace, but then we'll choose something unique here. We'll go uh, my lap pace, for example, choose field five. Uh, heart rate fields, there we go. Uh, I'm going to go with my heart rate zone instead. Uh, and there are many, many options for every one of these fields here. Um, I'll put up on the screen right now just some of the data fields for just the run sport profile alone. Again, every single sport profile is different things. There's no uh, swim stroke in running, for example, uh, just like there is no you know, cycling power meter in yoga. So lots of different options there. Uh, and then again, I can go and choose or customize other pages if I want to. In all this, you can customize with the Garmin Connect mobile app on your smartphone as well. So you don't have to like sit here and do this on the phone. Uh, that's true now for the Phoenix 7, Epix, and Instinct 2 series. So you can see some screenshots right here of this on the side and allows you to customize any of the sport profiles you want. In fact, virtually every single setting on the watch itself can be customized from your phone now. Uh, so we've got that set up. We'll go back here. Uh, there's also the ability to add alerts. So for example, I can add alert around my heart rate or run walk or pace or time or distance or cadence or calories or elevation or proximity. Um, all these things are, are different alerts that you can set up and you can add multiple alerts if you wanted to as well. Clicking on back again, there's the power mode we talked about earlier. So you may have a different power mode for hiking than you do for running. Uh, in general, you don't want to reduce the power consumption of your watch in workout modes unless you think you're going to go beyond your battery life. So for example, you don't want to reduce the recording rate. You don't want to reduce the GPS uh, accuracy rates unless you really need to, because otherwise you're just sacrificing those things for battery that you don't really need. Uh, so for example, if you're going for an eight hour hike, there's nothing you need to do on this watch. This has plenty of battery for an eight hour hike. Here's the battery chart right now on the screen right there. Uh, so that's not something you should tweak. However, if you're going out for you know, a week on the trails and doing eight hours every single day, then you want to think about the battery options and kind of figuring out how to tweak things from there. So here's a couple of options, metrodome and running. There's auto lap and auto pause and auto climb. Auto climb allows you to have a different set of data pages or a different data page when it detects you're climbing, when it detects you're going up a hill. That's different than Climb Pro that is on uh, the Phoenix 7 and Epix and other higher end Garmin watches. In fact, if you want a full video on the difference between something like the Instinct series and the Phoenix series, check out that video up there in the corner. It goes into all the depth between those two, uh, more than I could possibly ever cover in this video because that video is already like crazy long as it is. So clicking on back here, we'll get back to the, the run itself. Uh, at this point, I can click the start button there and that'll start my recording. And you can see my timer there, my distance, my pace aren't doing anything in my heart rate either because obviously I'm not going anywhere. Uh, if I click on down, I can see my next data page. This is a lap one I've configured. So lap pace, lap time, lap distance. Click on down again. That's my heart rate. This kind of shows my heart rate zones along the bottom right there. Uh, the time of day, just so I have that handy. Uh, and also showing you know, my 16 hour batteries. There's a live track starting. So that's using my phone that's over here. Just sent a message to a bunch of friends and family. They're probably confused as to why I'm live tracking at 10 o'clock at night uh, from the middle of you know, the office here. Going on down here, again, just different display of the distance and time. Uh, and then there's the field we just created with the lap time, distance, lap pace, heart rate, and the timer up at the top there. Now, I can go ahead and stop it if I want to up the right-hand side there. Uh, and with the Instinct series, you can also resume that later on. So you can see I can resume it, which means just to start it right again. I can save it. 
I can resume later on. So I can say, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and stop for lunch right here. I wanna save some battery uh, and then just go back into the sport later on. I can change sports entirely. I can create a lap if I wanted to. Um, I can go back to start. So this is navigation at this point uh, and I can choose discard. Before I do that though, let's just look at some navigation. So I'm gonna click back right here to get back into my activity. And then I'm gonna choose this middle left hand button there, hold it down, there we go. And now we see more options, the run settings like we had before. Uh, but if we go to navigation, this is where I can load up things like a course or run, navigate back to start, navigate an existing activity, go to a save location, site and go, go to coordinates. So if I were to open this up, I can then choose the exact coordinates I want. And this supports virtually every single coordinate type out there. So I'll put those on the screen right now as well. There's every coordinate type that you could possibly imagine is supported here. This is just the default one that I've got set up for. Uh, so if I go up the top here, courses, this is where I can look at different courses that I've saved to the unit itself. So for example, you see this 21K mountain bike course. I've got this uh, right here, 84K gravel ride. I've got also down here somewhere, some bigger ones. I've got the 16K hike, uh, a couple other things in here, but we'll go back up to the top right here and open up uh, this mountain bike one. Crack this open, there we go. Uh, and you can see I can do the course right away. I can look at a map of this particular course. And again, this is just a breadcrumb trail map. You're not gonna have any actual mapping on this, uh, but I could zoom in and out of this if I wanted to. I can use this upper right hand button to then change, uh, to zoom or not zoom, but uh, scroll up, press it again. You can see it's changing little dots right there and changing arrows on this side. This allows me to go to the right and the left. Again, zoom in. You know, it's, it's, it's not like uh, Google Maps or anything, but it, it gets the job done. Uh, and then click on back. I can do the course in reverse or I can look at the elevation plot. You can see there uh, my max and min elevations and the distance. And if I click on back here, uh, the name of the course, uh, I can edit or delete it. So I can choose do course right there. And that'll go ahead and load the course up. Uh, now the challenge is that many courses will trigger this course warning. Uh, now it's not really a warning, it's just straight up like course failure. So you see right here, this course exceeds a 50 point max limit. Now in the case of the Instinct it's 50 points, in the case of the Phoenix 7 and Epics, it's like 150 points. And you may be asking yourself, what is a course point limit? And the answer is there's no good answer. Uh, so it's not like the number of churns because this particular course churns way more than just uh, 62 times. So 50 plus the 12 not shown. Uh, it's out in the trails. It's gonna be churning, you know, even just a couple hundred meter stretch churns way more times than that. And it's not tied to distance either because that'll also vary. In fact, in general, there's really no good answers to what this is. And that gets to the question of what is a course point and how would you avoid exceeding it? Uh, and I've had some long conversations with Garmin about this and the answer is incredibly fuzzy. Uh, in general, you might see this warning more often on trails than you would not. So hence this is a trail ride versus I did a different uh, ride that was a road ride and didn't get any warnings at all for something that was many times longer than this. Uh, and the answer, unfortunately, in terms of like, how do you avoid exceeding it? isn't really clear. It seems so that if you create courses on Garmin Connect, you are far less likely uh, to go ahead and exceed it. Versus this case, this course was created on Strava and it seemed to exceed it despite being only 20 kilometers long. Uh, and keep in mind, course points is a very nebulous thing. It's not just like turn direction turns in a trail because uh, you, know, you would go through 62 uh, trail directional courses on a mountain bike trail like this in a matter of not even a kilometer, like that's just how the trail turns constantly. Uh, and it's not like actual directional left and right, like turn left or turn right either, because again, there's just way more of those than there is of this particular thing. And it's also not distance based because uh, there's no like link between the distances versus the actual course points. And so I wish Garmin was more clear on that. All the documentation I can find, all of my conversations with them are just incredibly fuzzy on how to avoid this, mostly because it probably doesn't very look very good. Like this is just frustrating. The point of all that though, like if you take anything away from this entire video, is that before you go for a hike or an adventure or something like that, at home, load up a course and choose do course to make sure it works. You can do it anywhere in the world for any of the course. This course right here is 2000 miles away in the middle of the ocean on a small island. So you can do this anywhere without GPS even uh, to validate the course loads. If it doesn't load, don't leave home with that course or split the course out into multiple pieces. Uh, otherwise it's just simply not gonna work and that, that kind of sucks. Anyways, I'll choose okay because I have no other choice. Uh, you can see now if I load this up, 
uh, there we go. I've now got my uh, elevation profile in this particular course showing the elevation portion that it wanted to render anyways. Uh, and I've got this would be my heading and whatnot if I had GPS outside and where I am on the trail itself. And it'll also give you an estimated time uh, as well as distance remaining on that particular trail based on your current point in time. Now, since we're here in the sport mode profiles, let's look at sensors. So to the middle button right there, menu, you can access the accesses from anywhere in the watch, not just sport profiles. We'll go on down until we see sensors. We'll tap this to open it up. There we go. And you can see this is where I control the sensors that are internal, like the wrist heart rate, pulse ox, compass, altimeter, barometer. Club sensors are golf. I don't know why club sensors is always separate from the other sensors. Somehow it's more special, but whatever. Uh, and then these are all sensors I've already saved to the unit. So heart rate sensors. This is a Bluetooth heart rate strap. This is a amp plus power meter. This is a amp plus power meter. Power meter, power meter, power meter, power meter, power meter, power meter. I do a lot of power testing. Uh, more power meters, trainers, more power meters. I can go add new though. And go on down here and I can add a heart rate sensor, a speeding cane sensor, a power meter, foot pod, a verb, which is the action camera that you certainly wouldn't be buying in 2022, uh, Tempe, which is a temperature sensor, lights that are cycling lights that are connected, uh, cycling radar that are connected, extended display, that's to have a display in your head that allows you to see. It's like glasses that, again, you probably don't want to buy this in 2022 as well. Garmin hasn't done this in like five years or something. Uh, but RD pod for running dynamics, uh, that gives you running dynamics information around things like cadence or vertical oscillation from the RD pod, zero laser locations, in reach is our satellite communicator, dog tracking, and smart trainer. And most all of these are dual AMP plus and Bluetooth smart, as long as a Bluetooth smart version exists. Uh, again, there's a difference between this and something like the Phoenix series. If you're a cyclist, you'll notice there's no uh, gear shifting profiles uh, in here. Uh, this is one example. Uh, you can see my full video again in the corner there, for the differences between this from a sensor standpoint, including some of the data that is saved behind the scenes. In my case, I've used virtually all of the cycling and running sensors with this without any problem in it. It works just fine. Okay, so going back to our, our fake workout here, when you're done, you go ahead and just choose this top button there to stop it. Uh, and then from there, you can save the workout. And then once you've saved your workout, you can see some of the screenshots right here, what you'll get after the fact on the workout, uh, whether it's a long workout or a short workout or a hike or anything it is, uh, all the information is saved to Garmin Connect and then turn sent out to apps like Strava and any other platform that you use for tracking those activities. Uh, and you can dive into them on the Garmin Connect mobile, the smartphone app or a web browser on your desktop, wherever you want uh, and to analyze all that stuff, uh, just as you would for any other activity on any other watch. Now, before we dive into the solar and the Garmin Pay bits on the solar, edition. Let me talk about a quick little trick that's true for all these watches. In fact, true for most Garmin watches, uh, which is the ability to add a flashlight to this. Now, this watch does not have a flashlight uh, like the Phoenix 7X series does, uh, but you can go ahead and repurpose some, you know, hotkeys to do that. So go ahead and back in the menu there, hold this down for a quick second, and then go on down. There we go. Do, 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 until we get to system. There we go. And then all the way down again until we get to hotkeys. Uh, now, this is where you can set a hotkey. For example, uh, if you were to hold the GPS button right here, this will access GPS. If you hold the back button down here, this is to set something. Uh, now, I'm going to repurpose this right here. So there we go. And I'm going to say, I want that instead to be my flashlight. Let's see where to go down. There we go. Flashlight. There we go. Boom. Choose that. And then I'll back out. So now, at this point, I'm going to turn off the backlight. It's kind of hard to see it's a backlight because the you know, lights in here are pretty bright. But what I want you to notice is I'm going to hold this bottom right hand button down for a second. And boom, this just lit up the screen. Now, of course, in this bright studio, it doesn't look like very much. But here's a quick little snippet of what it looks like in a dark room where it actually illuminates quite a bit at its full brightness. Uh, so this is a really quick and easy way to turn the flashlight on to use if you get around your house in the middle of the night. Uh, again, it's not as good as the 7X flashlight, of course, but this costs like one third that. So that's something to consider. And you just back out just by pressing this and you're back to the main menu. You can turn it on again by doing that. And it's neat. It's a neat little trick to do. Okay, so let's talk solar. Speaking of like this bright things. Uh, so both of these watches are the solar editions. So we have the uh, Instinct 2S solar and the regular solar. So in the case of solar, the way it works is there's two different panels here. Uh, there's one panel that's solar that's around the outside edge. And you can see this right there. It kind of reflects right there. This whole outer edge, that is all solar panel it, the full like intensity if you will that it can receive so anything the sun throws at it it gets to it at the full amount however 
there's a separate panel below this entire thing, above the display, but below the, the surface, if you will, the glass surface is plastic. But either way, that's all the way across this entire area right there. Uh, and that has a far reduced uh, kind of sun consumption level, but it's also way bigger in size. Uh, so if you look at and combine those two things together, you get this chart right here on the screen, and that shows you what you get from a solar capacity standpoint. Now, the thing to keep in mind about solar on these watches, the Garmin specs out all those metrics right there, based on three hours a day at 50,000 lux. Uh, now 50,000 lux actually isn't that much. Uh, now here in the winter in the Netherlands, uh, it's mostly rainy and cloudy every single day. So if I have my watch underneath my coat, I'm never gonna get three hours a day uh, out here. And you know, on a normal like overcast day, that's not 50,000 lux either. That's gonna float between 10 and say 30,000 lux. However, even in the winter here on a sunny day, I'm clearing almost 70,000 lux, which is beyond Garmin specs uh, for these sort of watches. So three hours outside in the sun in the winter, that's clear their specs and it meets this chart. However, if you apply that to the summertime, now you're talking something like 100, 120,000 lux out in the sun, which means you have more than double of what Garmin's charts are. So Garmin's charts are actually really conservative when it comes to that, and especially if you're spending more than three hours a day in the sun. So last summer on the Garmin Instinct 1 series watches, I managed to unlock forever power. You actually get a little infinity icon for your battery life because I was in a Mediterranean island and I spent you know, hours outside in the sun every single day and I was clearing 120,000 plus lux every single day. Uh, so in that case, you can do that. And it isn't really that hard to do, depending again on where you live in the sun conditions. Now, the way you can see solar is two different options. Number one, on the default watch face, this over right here, this will be showing me normally my sun conditions. I'm indoors and it hasn't been sunny in the last six hours indoors, uh, but here's a picture of what it looks like outdoors. And you can see that watch face option there. Or I can scroll down, if I scroll down once, you'll see right there, solar intensity is the default and it's shown in two different spots. One is this little piece right here that's divided up into eight blocks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the middle part is technically a ninth block. Same true on both of them. Uh, and then once it fills up fully, that means you've got full sun at the 50,000 lux. The unit itself won't show you more than 50,000 lux. It just tops out 50,000, but it does consume more than 50,000 lux. Or I have this widget right here, solar intensity widget. I crack that open and this will show me my solar intensity uh, for the last while as well. And uh, you can see again, these little blocks right there. In this case, you get 10 blocks, by the way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, all the way around, uh, plus the middle one, and then the last six hours. And I can see then a chart of this. Here's a chart again of what it looks like outside. Now, the core difference between this and something like the Phoenix series is the Phoenix will give you uh, your total consumption, your inbound consumption of solar each day versus the technology on this particular watch can't do that. So it does actually though get more solar power than the Phoenix does. Uh, so there's just more solar surface area here because all the space on the side here is actually way more than the Phoenix has despite being a bigger watch. So that is the solar side of it. Now with solar though, you get one of the feature, which is Garmin Pay. And that, these are the only two features that differ between the base and the solar edition is solar and Garmin Pay. So to access Garmin Pay, put this off the side there. I go to the controls menu up here and you see my wallet right there. Now in this case, I pre-set up my wallet ahead of time with the Garmin Connect app. Uh, and so you basically added credit card information there. The key thing though is your bank has to be supported. And I say bank, not like just Visa or Amex or something like that, your individual bank. Garmin has to go to every single bank worldwide, just like Apple and uh, Google and Samsung, others have to do, and they have to enroll those banks. And so, you know, for most of the big US credit card companies, those are by like Chase and others, uh, those are in here. But if you're like me in the Netherlands, I ING, my bank isn't in here. Uh, but other banks in the Netherlands are, and other banks in other countries are. You gotta look at the Garmin's big list. Point is, once you've got that added in, go ahead and crack this open. I then put my passcode in, secret. There we go. And then it'll show me this screen right here. Uh, this is my US credit card. Uh, and so in this case, you can see I've got a timer. It's counting down up there in the corner right there going around. And then you simply just take this and tap it on the reader and you're good to go. And there's a me tapping on it reader the other day uh, right there and paying for something. So as long as there's a contactless payment reader, NFC reader, you can pay for something. And again, this is just in the solar editions. It's not in the base editions. It's also in the diesel edition too, I believe, and um, some of the other special editions as well. So you gotta look and see which is which is which there. Now I point out that I couldn't possibly fit everything into this video. It's I'm recording for an hour and one minute, according to my timer over there right now, uh, which is super long, but I've also got a written review, which is like 15,000 words long, which has even more tips and tricks and caveats to be aware of. So definitely check that out and link down below right there. Um, also again, if you found 
found this video interesting, it really does help out to hit the like button or subscribe or leave a comment down below. All those things tell YouTube that you found this useful and thus uh, hopefully I'll keep on making more of these because you found them useful. See, it's like a, a circular sort of thing. Anyways, with that, have a good one.